You know, I, I want to invite us into this place of, of prayer uh, just to kind of open ourselves up to the Word of God to say, you know what, God, whatever it is that you have to say to us, God, come and have your way. And so will you join me as we commit this time to God together in prayer? God, again, it feels like, like just such an amazing sense of gratitude in our lives and in our hearts to what you did on that cross. God, we pray that we'll never lose the wonder of the cross. And so God, even as we dive into your word, as we go into the Old Testament, to see what this looks like, that God, it will come alive to us. Lord, it will add a deeper revelation, but more than that, Lord, it will stir something within our hearts to love you more. And so we thank you. We commit this into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You know, one day, um, a man kind of went up to his wife, and, and she was in the midst of cooking roast, roast beef. And he asked his wife this, you know what, dear, why, why is it every time you cook roast beef um, that you, you always cut the two ends of the roast? Now, his wife looked at the man and said, you know what, that's a really good question. I've actually never thought of that. In fact, I don't know the reason why, uh, but I do know that my mom did it every time. Every time my mom cooked roast, she would cut off the ends of, of the roast. And so, let, let's go ask mom. And so, the couple went over and they went to go find the wife's mother. And they went, hey, mom, you know what, I, I just had a question. You know, why is it that you always cut the two ends of the roast when you cook it? The mother looked at the girl and said, you know what, that's a really good question. I've actually never thought of that. Um, but my mother, your grandmother has always done it that way. And so, you know, why don't we go ask your grandma? So they went, took the car, they went over to grandma's house, and they asked, hey, grandma, why, why did you always cut the two ends of the roast whenever you cook roast? And the grandmother looked at the granddaughter and her daughter and said, you know what, that's a really good question. I don't actually know why I cut the two ends of the roast, um, but I've always saw your great-grandmother do it. And so let's go ask her. Now, fortunately, great-grandmother was alive, and so they went to go visit great-grandmother. They went to go visit great-grandmother, and they said, you know what, great-grandma, you know, I've been asking mom and grandma why they always cut the two ends of the roast, and they don't know why. And so I thought I'll ask you, great-grandma, why did you always cut the two ends of the roast when you cooked roast? Now, the great-grandmother looked at her great-granddaughter and said, Oh, honey, I have no idea why your mother and your grandmother and you cut the two ends off your roast when you cook it. But the reason why I did it was because the roast could never fit in the oven when I cooked it. And it's an interesting thought, isn't it? Because sometimes it's so easy for us to go through the motion of doing things and, and just going through the routine, and we don't really know why we do certain things, right? It's easy for us to kind of forget, right? Without so much as a consideration as to the reason why we're doing certain things. And can I tell you, it's the same with us as a church. Not just us as a church, but it's the same with the capital C church. Sometimes the church is so caught up in tradition. And traditions aren't a bad thing. At times they're a really good thing. But we're so caught up with tradition, we're so caught up with the way things are done, that sometimes we don't have much consideration as to why they're done in the first place. Have you ever thought about it? Why do we gather to sing songs to God? Why do we lift up our hands? Why do we celebrate or remember Good Friday? Why do we gather around the table of communion as we will do later on at the end of our service? You know, oftentimes we may have an idea as to what this looks like, but yet at other points we just do it because, well, everybody's been doing it. Our parents have been doing it. Our, our parents' parents have been doing it. And so we just kind of go through the motion. And that's kind of what we want to talk about today because as we gather around the table of communion, as we remember Good Friday, the question we need to ask is why do we as Christians remember Good Friday? Why is Good Friday so significant to us? Why do we as a church gather around the table of communion every month? Why are we doing it even today? And a lot of this can be traced back to something that we call the Passover. And so today, the title of my message and what we're going to be focusing on is we're going to be focusing on Christ and the Passover. What, what this means to us, not just in our lives, but what does this mean to us in relation to what happened on Good Friday, in relation to what happened on the cross. Because we're not just believing in something that happened historically. 
were believing in something that was foretold about, that was talked about, that was alluded to thousands of years before it even happened. Christ and the Passover. Now, in order to understand this, though, the first question we need to ask is, what is the Passover? Is it something that you just walk over? Is it something that you just kind of overlook? What, what does this look like? Now, the Passover was a festival that the people of Israel celebrated every year. In fact, it kind of highlighted kind of like their new year in that sense. Uh, and, and we'll understand a lot more about this as we dive into the book of Exodus. Okay, so turn with me to your Bible. to Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12, we'll be reading from verse 1 all the way to verse 13. And before we read, I'm going to give us an idea as to what's happening. Um, now in Exodus chapter 12, verse 1, there are a few things that happens before this, in the lead up to this. The context is this. So the people of Israel were enslaved by the people of Egypt for 400 years. About there, lah, I got Okay, so about 400 years they were enslaved. Now, at the end, towards the end of that 400 years, God decided to send them a deliverer by the name of Moses. Now, Moses showed up and he asked Pharaoh, the ruler of Egypt, to let the people of Israel go. Now, Pharaoh was a stubborn man, more stubborn than your spouse, believe it or not, and he decided not to do it. And so in the midst of all of this, God used Moses to send nine plagues. Okay, nine plagues to Egypt in the hope that Pharaoh would relent and let the people of Israel go. Now, the nine plagues are this. Okay, and we see this from Exodus um, chapter 7 all the way to chapter 11. You've got water turn, turning to blood in the river now. You've got the frogs coming. You've got the gnats. You've got the flies. You've got the livestock of the Egyptians dying. You have the Egyptians getting boils all over their bodies. You've got locusts coming to eat everything and destroy everything in the land. And then you've got darkness. Darkness that takes over the land, no light at all for a few days. And it kind of leads us into Exodus chapter 12. Because throughout all of this, Pharaoh is still stubborn, as stubborn as a mule, and he is not willing to let the people of Israel go. And that's where we are in Exodus chapter 12. And so what happens is this. God begins to speak to Moses. And so the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in Egypt, this month is to be for you the first month, the first month of your year. So again, it kind of, God was establishing that this was going to be the new year. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. If any household is too small for a whole lamb, they must share one with their nearest neighbor, having taken into account the number of people there are. You are to determine the amount of lamb needed in accordance with what each person will eat. Now the animals you choose must be year-old males without defect, and you may take them from the sheep or the goats. Take care of them until the 14th day of the month, when all the members of the community of Israel must slaughter them at twilight. Then they are to take some of the blood and put it on the sides and tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night, they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire, along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. Do not eat the meat raw or boiled in water, but roast it over a fire with the head, legs, and internal organs. Now, do not leave any of it till morning, and if some is left till morning, you must burn it. Now, this is how you are to eat it with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. Now highlight that if you have it in your Bibles. It is the Lord's Passover. It's the first time we see this in the Bible. On that same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. And I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Now, you have to understand that, that when this kind of happened, um, once this happened, Pharaoh kind of released the people of Israel. The people of Israel left, and, and they got their freedom. They went into the wilderness uh, for about 40 years uh, because of certain events that happened. And then they made it into the promised land. 
Now, this is important for us because this is what Passover represents. The reason why Passover as a festival was so significant, so important for the people of Israel, was because it was a time in which they remembered the deliverance of God. It was a time in which they remembered the freedom that they experienced from 400 years of slavery. It was something that they did to remind themselves of the new beginning that they had, hence the new year. Right? It wasn't just because of the time or the year ended. No, the new year came about because of a significant time in their lives, from one as slaves to one as free people. And so that's what Passover represents. And as they partook of the Passover every year, and they did this all the way even into Jesus' time, even till today, they still partake of the Passover. It is, again, to still remind them of the freedom that they have because of God the power of God. But it also reminds them of two very specific truths that that they understood and they caught through what happened in these events that we just read about. Number one, and we're just going to walk through this very, very quickly, and then then we're going to try and unpack this as to what does this mean for us today? How does this apply to us? Because number one, we're not Jewish. Number two, we don't really celebrate the Passover. I mean, our New Year is either 1st of January or whenever the Chinese calendar tells us or the lunar calendar. But there are two truths, again, that the people of Israel remember and are reminded of every time they celebrate Passover. Number one, it is that no one was spared from the final judgment of God. Now, it's interesting. We see this in verse 12 because in verse 12, God tells the people of Israel, on the same night I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. Now notice that there is no distinction between Israelite or Egyptian. There is no difference. There is no differentiation at all. And this is something which is very important for us to understand. Because when you see it in light of the previous nine plagues, the previous nine plagues, it happened only to the Egyptians. It did not happen to the Israelites. The Israelites kind of had some sort of an immunity to the plagues. The Bible says this, that that when darkness covered the land of Egypt, the land in which the people of Israel were at still had light. They still had day. You know, when, when the livestock died, only the livestock of the Egyptians died. The livestock of the Israelites did not die. And we see that there's a distinction. In fact, why was there a distinction? We don't really know. The Bible doesn't say. But what we do know is that the people of Israel did nothing to earn nor deserve that distinction. It was by simple virtue that God wanted to make a differentiation or a distinction between His people, Israel, and Egypt. So again, you you have to understand this. But it's interesting because once it hits the 10th plague, nobody is spared. Nobody is spared. And one of the things that the people of Israel would have been reminded of is that, number one, no one was spared from the final judgment of God. Because they too, the people of Israel too, they had sinned before God. Now, if the people of Israel ever thought that, you know what, whatever God's going to do, you know, we could just sit back, kick back, relax, enjoy the show, eat our popcorn, watch what's happening across the border in Egypt, you know, and, and just enjoy what's happening and enjoy our life, you know what, they would have been rudely awakened when they heard this coming out from Moses' mouth. Wait, 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 wait. You mean, when you say both people and animals, you meant both Egyptians and animals, right? You see, can you notice that they were, they've gone through nine plagues. They didn't have to worry about a thing. And then all of a sudden, the tenth one comes out. All people. No, no, no not just the Egyptians. No, no. We're, we're included, guys. Um, people of Israel, listen up. God's going to judge us. The firstborn of every person and livestock is going to die. And so that's the first truth. That's the first thing they were being reminded of, that no one was spared from the final judgment of God. But the second is this, is that while no one was spared from the final judgment of God, there was only one way to avoid that final judgment. You see, where where God has to judge, God always provides a way out. And and while God was judging everybody with the tenth plague, He gave Israel a way out. Now, the way out was this, that the blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. Hence the festival being known as the Passover, 
No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt. Notice how that the only way to escape or to avoid this judgment was to obey or to follow a condition. Now, the condition was this, that they had to kill a lamb. And then they had to smear the blood. Now, it wasn't just any kind of lamb. There were certain conditions that they had to meet with this lamb as well. Now, it had to be a lamb that was one year old. Now, you may be wondering, why one year old? Now, when a lamb is one year old, it is considered mature. It's considered old. It's considered an adult. It's no longer considered a kid in that sense. And so it had to be old enough to be an adult. It had to be mature. It had to be without blemish. You know, no bone could be broken. It had to be spotless. Um, and there were other conditions that were there that they had to meet. And then they were to kill it. And then they were to smear its blood on the doorpost. And smearing the blood on the doorpost itself wasn't enough. They had to then enter the house and remain in it. Now, there were other things that they had to do, and, and because of time, we're not going to dive too much into it. Although, I mean, you would have read it, right? You may be wondering, what's all this about? There's so many instructions, how to cook the thing, how to eat the thing. Now, there is great significance behind every single one of those things, and, and we don't have a lot of time to unpack that today, but yet, it, it is something if you want, you can, you can feel free to go and Google, go, go and study about it, and we can talk about it over coffee one day. But there was only one way to avoid the final judgment, kill a lamb, there were conditions that had to be met, smear the, smear the blood, stay in the house. And so two things, two things that the people of Israel would have been reminded of every time they gathered around Passover. Yes, they would have remembered their deliverance, but they would have also remembered the truth that no one was spared from the final judgment of God. And number two, that while that was true, God also provided a way out for them. The question is, what does this have to do with Good Friday. And more than that, what does this have to do with us? Now, what we read in Exodus chapter 12 is more than just a historical event, a historical recollection. It has within it truths that don't just apply to the people of Israel then, it has to it truths that apply to us today. Because in the same way, there are two things that, that I believe God wants us to be reminded of this morning as we gather around the finished work of the cross. Number one is that in the same way no one was spared from the final judgment of God in Exodus chapter 12, all of us will face the final judgment of God at the end of all time. All of us will face the final judgment of God. See, the people of Israel may have taken their, their immunity from the nine plagues for granted. Can I tell you, when I make this statement, all of us will face the final judgment of God. I want to be very clear. It doesn't matter whether you're Christian or not Christian. It doesn't matter whether you've been born in a Christian home. It doesn't matter whether you've not experienced hardship in your life. It doesn't matter if, you are, if you've been a righteous man and you've done good things and you've never done a bad thing, never told a lie. It doesn't matter if you're held in high regard. It doesn't matter how much money you have in your bank account. It doesn't matter how highly esteemed you are in society. All of us will face the final judgment of God. You know, and it's easy for us sometimes, and it may have been easy for the people of Israel, oh, but what well, the people of Israel? No, like God say only like, he's not going to do it. I mean, we've seen the evidence of that. The last nine times we've not been killed. Nothing has happened to us. You know, why do we need to follow the conditions that he said? He's going to be gracious. Can I tell you, church, don't mistake the grace of God for his salvation. Don't mistake the grace of God for his salvation. They, deserve, they did nothing to deserve his grace, yet he still gave it. But yet when it came to the final judgment, there were things that he required them to do. And that in itself was an act of his grace. But the first truth we need to understand is that all of us will face the final judgment of God. Now we see this in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Again, remember, even if the Israelites, if the Israelites weren't exempted, how much more us? We're not going to be exempted at all. I mean, they were the people of God. They were His chosen people. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And maybe, again, there are some of us here, we, we've been coasting through life. There is no need for God in our lives. We, we've not had a significant event that has pointed us to a direction where we are in need of God. Can I tell you, that doesn't mean that you're exempted from the final judgment of God. 
Because again, as Christians, we believe that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I include myself in that list as well. I am not immune to the final judgment of God. I will be judged. Now, what does this judgment look like? Now, we know that in Exodus chapter 12, the judgment was death and the death of the firstborn. Now, the the final judgment of God in our lives and for all of eternity will be eternal death. Now, again, we know this because in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, for the wages of sin is death. You know, what is this death? It's eternal death. What is it? It's not that, it's not just physical death. It is a spiritual death. It is an eternity without God in your life. Can I tell you, that's the worst kind of life you could ever have. It is the worst state of being. And and the first thing that I want us to know and I want us to catch as as a body of Christ as we gather together is this truth that all of us will be subject to the final judgment of God. For all have sinned and fallen short and the wages of sin is death. But again, praise be to God. Because the gift, I love how verse 23 doesn't end there. It continues, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Because in the same way that we see God provide a way in Exodus chapter 12, God also provided a way for us through Christ. You see, I love Exodus chapter 12 because Exodus chapter 12 isn't just a historical event. Exodus chapter 12 alludes to the fact that in the days to come, a greater Passover lamb will come because there's going to be a greater judgment that is awaiting humanity. Now, who is this greater Passover lamb? It is Jesus. See, the second truth that I believe God wants us to remember today is that Jesus is our Passover lamb. Now, how do we know this? Again, through the Scriptures, we see a few different things, but number one, he actually meets the requirements and the conditions of a Passover lamb, at least a literal one, when it came to Exodus chapter 12. Now, he wasn't one year old, but he was a mature adult. In Luke chapter 3, verse 23, it tells us that Jesus was 30 years old when he started his ministry. He would have been about 33 when he died. And, and, and that is something which, again, it highlights the place of maturity. He was spotless and blameless. He was without blemish. The Bible tells us this as well in, in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 22, that he was without sin. No bone was broken. The Bible tells us this at the death, at his death on the cross, that as they were about to break off his legs, which was what they typically did every time someone hung on the cross, to quicken a death, they pierced him in the side instead. You see, there were many things that happened in Jesus' life that fulfilled the conditions of a Passover lamb, at least through the eyes of Israel. But more than that, there is actually a greater significance because Jesus himself died around Passover. Did you know that? Did you know that when Jesus died on the cross, the very day that he died was the day in which the Jewish people were celebrating Passover. And so you see, everything kind of lines up. There is a great significance behind this. And if that isn't even enough, the Bible tells us this. In fact, Paul himself makes an allusion to this in 1 Corinthians 5, verse 7 to 8. He says, get rid of the old yeast. And again, this is something which they were talking about when it comes to Passover. They had to eat unleavened bread so that you may be a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival not with the old bread leavened with malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. You see, even Paul himself recognized that Jesus was the greater Passover lamb. And so what does this mean to us today? Number one, the first thing is this. Do we really believe that all of us will be subject to the final judgment of God? Because if we don't believe that in the first place, can I tell you, nothing that I say, nothing that, the, that God says will break through because you don't need God. In fact, if you don't believe that, I will tell you that if I were to believe what you believe, then I will agree with you. You don't need Him. But yet, I know without a shadow of doubt that that is not true. 
Because God is real. God is real and, and what He says is true. It will come to pass. No word that He has said will fall to the ground. Every word will be fulfilled in His time and every single one of us will come under the judgment of God. Then the next question we need to ask is, are we under the blood? Because if there's only one way to escape that judgment, and if it's only through the blood of Christ, then are we under it? Now, it leads us to another question, though, because we may say, you know what, that's a really great question, but I don't even know what it means to be under the blood. And so I just want to share with us two things that this looks like. Number one, you have to believe. You have to believe that everything that I've said thus far is true. Not because I say it, but because the Bible says it. You have to believe it because you have to believe that there is a God who created the heavens and the earth, a God who created you, a God who loves you, a God who is righteous and a God who is just. Now you may say, but, but, but if God is righteous, but if he's also gracious, then wouldn't that be enough? Can I tell you, the grace of God is there. But the grace of God loses its power in the absence of the righteousness of God. If God is not just, if God is not righteous, then there is no need for his grace. The two have to come together. And we have to believe that. We have to believe that, yes, God is not just a gracious God, but God is also a righteous God. God is going to send people to eternal death. Not because he is evil, but because he is just. Because at the end of the day, I deserve it. We deserve it. We deserve nothing less than death. For the wages of sin is death. We need to not just believe that that is true, but we need to believe that Jesus is the only way to experience eternal life. Jesus is the only way to avoid this judgment. And if we believe that, then what we need to do is we need to call upon the name of God. But you see, it's not enough to just believe. We need to live. Let me give us an example. Let's go back to Exodus chapter 12. Now imagine with me, you're going around and you're telling people, hey, you know what? Um, we just heard this from Moses, and so you better go get your lamb, uh, and we've got to get this done. Hey, hey, go tell your friends. Get, get them to come in. And did you know that this condition of coming in the house wasn't just for the people of Israel? Did you know that the Egyptians, if they heard and if they believed, they could have gone into the house? Now we know this because as Israel is getting ready to, to be delivered and they've been set free, God tells them that if there are any foreigners, anybody who wants to join them, that they are to partake of the Passover too. That means there may have been a high possibility that they may have reached out to their Egyptian friends or maybe a good, a, a, a good person and, and, and told them about what's happening and invited them into their house and they would have been spared from the judgment of God. Now, in that same way, we must believe that. Now, now, again, picture this. You go out, you're telling people, and then there's a bunch of people who don't believe you, and so they do nothing about it. Now, what's going to happen to them? Their firstborn's going to die. Now, imagine you go to another group, and you tell them what's going to happen. And they say, you know, oh, yeah, it sounds true. It sounds like it will really happen. You know what? I really believe that. But if they do nothing about it, they don't go to your house, they don't come under the blood, they don't stay in the house, their firstborn is still going to die. So the question we need to ask ourselves is, is, if we believe, then are we coming under the blood? Now, if we've already come under the blood, the next question we need to ask is this, are you staying under the blood? Now, we're getting into a bit of, of theology here because we're asking, can we lose our salvation? Now, I tell you this, answer me this. If in Exodus chapter 12, if I was in the house that had the blood, and for some reason, I don't know, maybe I was playing football and then the ball went out the window. And as the ball, because the ball went out the window, I decided to go out the window and not listen to my mother and go out the window to go get the ball. And just as I went out to get the ball, the angel of death came by. I would have died. It didn't matter if I was under the blood and in the house before. It was, where are you under the moment the angel comes? 
And again, this is something which is important. This is why the yeast is actually important. The yeast that we talk about in 1 Corinthians, the yeast that, that they talk about in, in the Passover, because they had to eat unleavened bread, no yeast. It represents this place of, are you living righteously now that you've come under the blood? Because yeast always represented sin. And again, this is something which is so important for us to understand and to catch because the question that I believe that God is asking us today and with this I want to invite the worship team to come up and join me is are we under the blood? Now again, it's not enough to be called a Christian. It's not enough to identify as a Christian. It's not enough to grow up in a Christian home. The question is this, what do you really believe? Do you believe that without Christ you will face the death in eternity or eternal death? Do you believe that, that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God? Do you believe that when Jesus died on the cross, that his blood is the very thing that covers us? That the only way that we can avoid the final judgment of God is through that because Christ came to be our substitute. Do we believe that? Because that's what Passover is about. That's what Good Friday is about. That's what gathering around the table of communion is about. It's about remembering these truths. It's about remembering that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That if it were not for Christ, we would die in eternity. It's a reminder that it's not just enough to believe in the blood, but we have to live under the blood. And this morning with every head bowed and every eye closed, I believe that there are three calls that God wants to make today. Because maybe there are some of us here, you're listening to what I'm saying, and, and maybe you've heard it for the first time, or maybe you've heard it before, but you don't really believe it, but maybe now something's stirring up. Yes, there has to be something more to this life. I don't really understand what it looks like yet. Can I tell you, just come under the house first. Don't, don't delay. You see, any moment that you delay is an opportunity for the life to be taken away. Because we don't know when the angel of death is going to come. Nobody knows the time nor the day. I mean, we've heard about the, the recent events that have happened. Different ones losing their lives. In fact, the attack that happened just yesterday. I mean, life is unpredictable. Can I beckon you to come under the house? Come under the blood. Jesus died for you. Jesus is patient, not wanting anybody to perish. He has provided a way out, but, but I tell you, His grace also comes with a condition that you believe. And if you say, you know what, Tim, I, I, I don't know what this looks like, but, but I'm willing to just come under the house, come under the blood first, and, and continue this journey of figuring out what it looks like. See, and, and I want you to know it's okay because the people of Egypt if they went under the house they had no idea everything else that they needed to do for Passover they just came into the house and if that's you maybe you're here in our, in our service maybe you're, you're joining us online and if you're here in our service I want you to very very quickly just put up your hand and put it down because we want to pray for you in the next few moments if you're joining us online, just log in that Zoom room and, and we want to pray for you. And so here, if you're saying, no, Tim, I, I'm listening to what you're saying and, and I don't want to, to face the final judgment of God. I want to avoid the, the judgment of eternal death. And, and I hear what you're saying and I'm here and I hear that the only way is through the blood of Christ. I hear that the only way is through Jesus. And again, I don't know everything else that comes with that, but, but I'm willing to take that step of faith to say, you know what, then, then count me in. Let me come under the house. Let, let me come under the blood. Again, if that's you, just very, very quickly, just put up your hand and, and put it down. We, you know, we want to pray for you real quick. There's no need to be ashamed. When you're joining us online. Just let us know. Amen. Amen. For the second group of people, 
You know, you've come under the blood. But somewhere along the way, you've stepped out of it. You've not stayed. You've not continued to live your life as a pleasing sacrifice to God. I believe for the second group, God is saying this, then will you come in a place of repentance? Will you come back and stay in the house and, and learn what it means to stay, learn what it means to, to allow my blood to cover you and, and, and to watch over you and, and, and to be with you? That it's not just a one-time deal event, but, it, but it's something that is evident in your life every day. You know, if that's you, you say, you know, you're struggling with some things, you're struggling with living under the blood. Maybe you've walked away. Maybe you know that you're really close to stepping out of that house. We just respond to God today and say, you know what, God, here I am. God, come and, and, and draw me back in. God, remind me of, of your love, of your goodness, of your grace. And so if that's you, wherever you are, just lift up your hand, put up your hand and put it down real quick. And we want to pray for you. So yes, I see that hand, I see that hand. You know, you join that Zoom room again and then just let them know so that they can pray for you. Because I tell you this, there are some of us here who are awfully close to leaving the house and you don't even know it. I sense that, I sense that the word of God for us today is that there are some of us here who are awfully close to leaving the house. There's some of us here who have already left the house and you still think that you're in the house. Can I tell you, it's time to come back. It's time to come back. Don't be like the people of Israel who think that just because they've been immune to the last nine, that they're not gonna that they're gonna be immune to the final ten. Come back to him. Walk in his ways. Don't mistake his grace for his salvation. Oh hallelujah. So all across this place, why don't we stand? We're going to do a couple of things today because we still have our communion. <laughs> but the first thing that we're going to do is, is I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And maybe you didn't want to lift your hands. Maybe, maybe you were a bit embarrassed or a bit shy. No, it's okay. We, we want to walk us through this prayer to just say, God, we want to thank you for what you did on the cross. God, we choose to believe in you. Lord, we choose to come under the blood, come under the house. God, we, we want to go on this journey of getting to know you more. And for this, I want to invite the rest of us here. We made this prayer before to just lift up our hands. And, and if you want to make this prayer for yourself, I want you to lift up your hands as well. And, and I want us to just repeat this prayer after me. Okay, so all across this place, let's just lift up our hands. Jesus, Jesus. we thank you, we thank you. For, being for being our Passover lamb. We believe, we believe. that all have sinned and fallen short, and fallen short of, your glory. of your glory. And God, I ask, and God, I ask for, your forgiveness, for your forgiveness, for your love, for your, love, for your, grace, for your grace, to fill my life. To fill my life. I, ask I ask that you, that you become, Lord become Lord of my life. Of my life. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. God, we thank you for those who may have prayed that prayer for themselves. And God, I pray that wherever they are, that Lord, you will fill their heart with your love right now. And Lord, they will know without a shadow of doubt that it's more than just words that have come out of their mouth. Lord, they are speaking to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Lord, even though there is uncertainty in their minds as to what this means and, and what is going to happen, God, I pray that there will be such a peace that will come upon them, a peace that transcends all understanding, that will guard their heart, and that Lord, will accompany them on this new journey of faith in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, the second thing that we're going to do is, is we're going to open up the altars. And, and maybe if you made that prayer that we just prayed earlier, you now I want to invite you to come to the front and, and as our leaders pray for you. You know, I want you to let them know, hey, you know what? I made that prayer. I want to find out more about Jesus. And, and we're more than happy to journey with you on this journey. But it's not just open for you. It's open for the second group of people. Those of us here who, who we aren't sure, we're struggling with our faith. 
those of us here who, who are near the place of stepping out of, of the blood, those of us here who, who maybe now, as you hear me proclaim that word earlier, that there are some of us here who are outside the blood and we think that we are under it, and you're beginning to ask yourself, man, is that me? I don't know, could, could that be true? And, and if you're wondering, if you're having second thoughts, can I tell you, just come to the front. Because if you have full faith in God, then there is a full confidence that comes with that. And so, and so take it, as, take it as, as a sign that God is calling you to Himself. And, and we want to invite you to just come to the front and, and we want to pray for you for the next few moments before we partake of the evidence. But what we want to do is this. Because right after the time of ministry, right after the time of prayer, we're going to partake of the emblems of communion together. And so if you're going to join us in the front, I want to encourage you to just bring um, your, your cup and your wafer with you uh, because we're going to be doing that together as a body of Christ. And for the rest of us here, you know, as we respond to God, can we just recommit our lives to God? Can we just thank Him for His blood? Again, there is great significance. I don't know if, sometimes we don't fully get it, but I want you to picture yourself in Israel or with the Israelites. I want you to picture the wailing and the crying that you hear that night when many have lost their firstborn. And yet you look at your firstborn that is still alive. The only thing that I'll be able to do is give praise and thanks to God. That's what it's like for us, that we will never lose the wonder of our salvation. So maybe a separate call if you've lost the wonder of your salvation. Will you come to the front and allow God to restore unto you the joy of your salvation again? So I'm just going to close us in a word of prayer. And as the worship team leads us after that, again, let's just begin to respond to God. Let's come and say, God, restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Lord, help us not to step out of the house. God, we commit our life to you. God, we thank you for the finished work of the cross. And so God, once again, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for the truth. God, we thank you that it is not just the word of man, it is the word of God. And God, I pray that, Lord, it will be like a double-edged sword. It will cut through the bone and the marrow. God, your word will go out and it will not return to you void. And so God, I pray for a deep conviction in our hearts to stir again. God, restore unto us the joy of our salvation. Lord, may we never take it for granted. Lord, may we never take it for granted. God, we pray for those who may already be out of the house and they don't know anything that they're in. God, I pray that the scales on their eyes will be gone in the name of Jesus, that they will understand, they will come to the realization that they need to come back under the blood again. God, we pray for those who do not yet know you. God, we pray that you will bring them into the house. God, you desire none to perish and all to know you. God, we ask that the truth of your word will go forth like a powerful thing that will never come back void. Lord, it will do the work that it has set out to accomplish. And so Lord, as we spend the next few moments responding to you in this time of response and reflection, God, we want to come under the blood. God, we want to come under you. Lord, we want to meet with you. God, we want to rejoice in the joy of our salvation again. And so God, we pray that as different ones come to the altar, the Lord, you will meet with them and they with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.